It was home to one of America's great political couples, the place where he recuperated from polio, and the home where she helped him to become president. This is the room where Social Security was created. History was made here. Then, history was almost lost. Well, it was a bit of a mess. It had cobwebs, broken pieces of steps. A house that was rescued and transformed to create a gathering place for the next generation of American leaders. This program is made possible by the generous support of Corinne Barsky, Michael and Mary Gellert, Rosalind P. Walter, and now, Treasures of New York, Roosevelt House with John Meacham. History sometimes hides in plain sight. Of all the places clearly associated with Franklin Roosevelt, Hyde Park, Campobello, Warm Springs, one is too often overlooked, 4749 East 65th Street in Manhattan. This is a townhouse where Eleanor and Franklin Roosevelt lived and worked during some of the most crucial years of their lives. Given the vital role each played in the life of the nation and of the world, it's not saying too much to note that this seemingly ordinary New York house is one of the most important and least known addresses in American history. One of the first things that I do with a group of our um, honor students uh, when they start, we'll have a couple of sessions on their first week on campus and we'll do them here. And Roosevelt built It's the first day of class for the Roosevelt Scholars, a freshman group of Hunter College students. So he could actually navigate and be... And today, the students have a special guest, Jennifer Rabb, president of the college. Rabb has a special fondness for this place. It's not your ordinary classroom. ...part of the administration. And there's one particular story that we wanted to show you, so Dylan's going to put on the video. I am glad of this opportunity to extend my deep appreciation to the electorate of this country, which gave me yesterday such a great vote of confidence. It is a vote that had more than mere party significance. It transcended party lines and became a national expression of liberal thought. And I pledge you this, and I invite your help in the happy task of restoration. So that is Roosevelt. That's his first radio address the, the day after he was elected president, November 9th, 1932. And anybody have a guess where it was filmed? Here. Right here and right where you're sitting. And that's amazing, it was that fireplace behind them. How this house on Manhattan's Upper East Side, where the Roosevelts lived among us for 24 years, became the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute at Hunter College is a remarkable story, as is the story of the Roosevelts themselves. They were distant cousins, members of a great American family. Franklin grew up as the adored child of a doting mother and an aged father. Eleanor had a bleaker time of it, the daughter of an alcoholic. After a childhood at Springwood, the family's Hyde Park estate on the Hudson. Franklin attended Groton, Harvard, and Columbia Law School. Eleanor was educated in Europe. The two became engaged in the year 1904. Their New York wedding was dominated by Eleanor's favorite Uncle Teddy, the President of the United States, who gave away the bride. When the newlyweds returned from their wedding trip, they received a gift from Franklin's mother, Sarah, a small drawing as a promise, signed, Mama, number and street not yet quite decided. She was building them a house. The good news is she bought them a house. The bad news was she was going to live on the other side of the house. She decided on East 65th Street and commissioned a prominent New York architect, Charles Platt, to design the homes. He conceived a six-story Neo-Georgian house that would appear from the street to be one big mansion with a single entrance. Once inside the vestibule, however, there would be two separate entrances, one to the left house, Sarah's, and one to the right, Franklin and Eleanor's. 
the houses would have identical layouts, mirror images with perfect symmetry. And Sarah requested a special family feature, doors that connected the two houses. Well, the original drawings show one major connection on the second floor drawing room levels. Sliding doors would open to a very large room where large parties could be held. Later, openings were made on the fourth floor, uh, and uh, the reason is all we can do is presume that there were four bedrooms and five children, and there was a lot of coming and going. Curtis Roosevelt, the eldest living grandson of Franklin and Eleanor, remembers the house fondly. We, of course, went back and forth between the two. I never thought of the difference. And because the two houses were so similar, it was easy to get lost. Well, when I was very young, I somehow crawled up the stairs to, to the next floor, and somehow I crossed over into the other house and found myself absolutely lost, burst into tears, and uh, had to be rescued. From the start, his grandmother Eleanor felt she needed rescuing too. In her memoir, Eleanor wrote, A few weeks after we moved into the house on East 65th Street, I sat in front of my dressing table and wept. I did not like to live in a house which was not in any way mine. Not only did Sarah design it and furnish it, she dominated the entire household, both sides. There are a number of places in the house where your mother-in-law could just walk into your life. Right. You could think about what that does to a young marriage. Despite her mother-in-law's heavy hand, Eleanor made do, and soon the house was filled with five children, seven servants, Sarah, Eleanor, and Franklin, who began his career as a lawyer. But he wasn't a very good lawyer, so he did what a lot of unsuccessful lawyers do. He went into politics. Franklin launched his political career in Albany in 1910, when he was elected to the New York State Senate as a Democrat. When Woodrow Wilson defeated cousin Theodore in 1912, Franklin went to Washington to take up a post Teddy had once held, Assistant Secretary of the Navy. The Roosevelts moved to the Capitol, and Franklin loved life in the arena, a life that became even more exacting and exciting when America entered the First World War in 1917. In 1918, there was a terrible influenza epidemic that killed millions of people worldwide. And uh, Roosevelt was touring battlefields in Europe as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. And uh, he got sick on uh, the way home, on the ocean liner back. He was taken back to New York to recover. Eleanor unpacked for him at 65th Street. And when she was unpacking, she found a series of love letters uh, between her husband and her social secretary, Lucy Mercer. And as she wrote later, the bottom fell out from my world. Eleanor was shattered, but stayed in the marriage. Her husband was still a rising political star. This was an era when private scandals tended to remain private. And in 1920, Franklin was nominated for vice president at the young age of 38. The Democrats lost that year to Warren Harding and Calvin Coolidge. Roosevelt's most difficult hours, however, lay just ahead. His own uh, defining moment came in 1921 when he was uh, stricken with polio at Campobello Island, uh, where they were uh, vacationing. You look at what Franklin Roosevelt went through when at the age of 39, the very peak of his life, having been nominated for vice president of the United States, recognized as the great young Democrat in the nation, perhaps, stricken by polio. So he could never walk again, could never stand alone again. Roosevelt needed to keep his paralysis out of the papers and was secreted off the island and back to 65th Street to recover. The house was well suited for his recuperation. And one of the things that Sarah had the foresight to do was she had two elevators installed in the home when it was built, which was somewhat unusual in 1908. The promising politician was now in a wheelchair, and some thought his career was over. But Eleanor stood by her husband, and over the next seven years, 
She, with the help of FDR aide Louis Howe, became the engine of the Roosevelt political machine. She was a surrogate for him at all sorts of uh, speeches. Her head was um, trying to build the New York State Democratic Party and to keep Franklin's name in the news. And indeed, she figured out many ways uh, with Louis Howe to make sure that he was regularly in the New York Times. And, and even if people didn't see him at events and parties that um, they felt that he was there and, and uh, a figure to be dealt with. In 1928, their work paid off. Seven years after he contracted polio, the Democrats of New York nominated Franklin Delano Roosevelt for governor. Franklin Roosevelt was elected to his first term as governor, and we see him in his new high office for the first time. Three years later, he sought the presidency. You have to remember that that's where, in those years in the 20s, is where he regained his physical strength and, and regained his sense of purpose. He's elected governor of New York and then president of the United States, and then with the courage and the humanity and the strength that is represented in his disability and his recovery, takes a nation also on its knees and crippled and lifts it up with hope and aspiration. It looks, my friends, like a real landslide this time. It was 1932, and the country was deep in depression. Roosevelt was well aware of the daunting job ahead of him. And Mrs. Roosevelt, being his eyes and ears in so many ways, never let him lose sight of the terrible poverty represented in the ghettos or the Hoovervilles that were developing in Central Park. So I think uh, he became much more understanding of people's uh, suffering. Between the election and the inauguration, 65th Street was Franklin Roosevelt's headquarters for planning his new administration. So this is possibly my favorite room in the house. This is Franklin Roosevelt's library. In the 1930s, the inauguration was still held in March, not January. So from November 8th, when he returns home as the president-elect to March, this is where he plans his administration. And essentially, this is where the New Deal was created. FDR interviewed candidates for his first cabinet here, including a woman named Frances Perkins. Franklin invites her up to his library, and it was here that he makes the offer for her to become the first woman cabinet secretary in United States history. But she was a very shrewd woman, and she proposes to him a concept which ultimately becomes Social Security, and she makes it a condition of her accepting the cabinet Take position. Franklin and Eleanor left for Washington in March 1933 and would spend the next 12 years in the White House. Franklin's mother, Sarah, stayed in New York until her death in 1941. With Sarah gone, the Roosevelts decided to sell the house on 65th Street. When they lived in New York, the Roosevelts had been actively involved with their neighbor, Hunter College, just a few blocks away. Founded in 1870, Hunter was originally a women's college specializing in teacher training. By the 1940s, the college had expanded and needed more space. The president of the college, George Schuster, approached the Roosevelts about the possibility of the college buying the house. And they had a vision that this should be an interfaith center. The Roosevelts lowered the price for the college and the deal was done. In 1943, the Sarah Delano Roosevelt Memorial House was opened. So this became the home of Hunter Hillel and the Newman Society and the Protestant Society and then other groups came along. Soon the house grew beyond an interfaith center and became a kind of sorority house for the mostly commuting students. Roosevelt House was a place where we went for parties, for meetings, I do remember the feeling of the importance of it, and the Roosevelt family were, were very impressive people, so that to be in what was their home was a very exciting thing. If the house impressed the Hunter girls, some of the Hunter girls impressed the house's former resident. Eleanor became a mentor to the students. Well, I became president of the freshman class at college, and from that point on, I was 
um, a student leader all the way till I became president of student council in my senior year, and that's what took me to Campobello. Naomi Block, Hunter class of 1942, attended a student leadership conference held each summer at the Roosevelt's home at Campobello. Eleanor was actively involved in the program. Not only did she uh, give us the facilities, but she also uh, gave us her presence. And not just being with us, but actually participating in many of the group discussions. These are pictures from my graduation. Naomi impressed Mrs. Roosevelt, and the following winter, she invited her to stay in the White House. In January 1942, just weeks after Pearl Harbor, 21-year-old Naomi Block, a senior at Hunter College, arrived. And the first night I was there, Mrs. Roosevelt had, uh, we had dinner in her sitting room, and after dinner she said to the group, there were four or five people, said, would you like to meet the president and Mr. Churchill. And they did. The next day, Naomi was invited to stay for lunch. And I came into the dining room, and there were place cards all over the, on every place. And since I'm somewhat nearsighted and quite vain and didn't want to wear my glasses, <laughs> my nose was down looking <laughs> at various plates until I found my spot. And lo and behold, I was next to Mr. Churchill. It was a weekend she will never forget. In the spring, Mrs. Roosevelt spoke at Naomi's graduation, and their relationship continued for many years. Naomi Block was only one of the many Hunter students influenced by the Roosevelt's generosity. Roosevelt House was the fun part of being at Hunter, where we hung out, we talked, we talked about our goals, what the trouble we were having in a class or how well we were doing in a class. We spoke about the instructors we had crushes on. We spoke about the next mixer where we were going to meet guys because remember, I was in the last class without any boys. There were no boys, although they were finally admitted in 1965 but there were frequent teas and dances. There were a lot of social activities, that gentleman's in a uniform. A lot of the men uh, came to social events here before they went off to the war. More than a few Hunter girls met their future husbands at Roosevelt House. Because it was very inexpensive to rent, there were a lot of weddings here. Hmm. And ironically, they all took place in the room downstairs in front of the mantel over the, under the picture of Sarah Roosevelt, the domineering mother-in-law. So right. one day we're going to do some research on whether those well, marriages the lasted. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt's marriage lasted until 1945, when Franklin died at his home in Warm Springs, Georgia. I remember walking in the streets, crying, and everybody else walking in the streets was crying because most people really felt that he was like a father or a grandfather to us. Over the years, Roosevelt House continued to be used by Hunter College, but it was not well maintained. And I remember sadly coming back when I was 14, and it was quite dilapidated and quite uncared for. The college system was not really responsible for maintaining the property. So you had a problem waiting to happen. By then, Hunter had become a part of the City University of New York. The City University system itself went through very hard times in the 70s and 80s. So there really was no investment in any kind of restoration or real maintenance plan for the home. So by the time uh, 1992 came around, it became too dangerous to really use the home for students and faculty anymore, and it was closed. Jennifer Rabb had a special affinity for the house. She'd served as chair of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Committee. So when she was appointed president of Hunter in 2001, she made the restoration of Roosevelt House a priority. It's very beautiful, the sort of geometric sense of the facade. Her appreciation for the building extended beyond its beauty and historic significance. She had an ambitious plan. And that was the vision behind this restoration, that we would reopen the home as a public policy institute. Rab thought the Roosevelt legacy and the family's connection to the college could enrich the lives of the entire Hunter community. Not everyone agreed. 
some of the faculty at that time doubted it should be a priority. But I had a vision for our students that if they would be able to learn in the home of these incredible leaders, that it would raise them up a level. Jennifer Rabb prevailed, and she turned to architect Jim Polshek to execute her vision. He remembers the day he first walked into Roosevelt House. Well, it was a bit of a mess. It had, I recall my first tour through it, the shadows, uh, cobwebs, uh, broken pieces of steps. You know, it really was uh, decayed, and yet, you know, the bones were good. This is the reception area. Everything had to be taken out and, and rebuilt. Um, but we rebuilt it in the exact style of Platt's drawings. You know, being a modernist at heart, of course, I, I liked it. It's, it's very spare. Simple moldings, graceful stairs, and fireplaces adorned with beautiful hand-carved mantles. Unlike other row houses of the day, there was light. Charles Platt, the home's original architect, had installed an atrium in between the two houses, which brightened even the darkest days. Polshik's job was to turn two houses into one public meeting place. It was not a typical historic restoration. This is a, a large urban university that uh, heretofore did not have a dedicated place for conferences. Everything had to be accessible. And it has to serve a whole variety of, uh, of, of functions. Small groups, large groups, working simultaneously. So that, that's the difference between a, uh, a Williamsburg historic, you know, restoration and a, and, a, and a working place. He began by demolishing the walls between the two houses, making it a single structure 35 feet wide. Then he imagined an unusual addition to the house, an auditorium, a gathering place for conferences and meetings. Here, he wanted to create a room for the 21st century. It seemed to me that the house should have, along with its restored portions, it should have a place which spoke uh, to coming generations. The auditorium was built where the backyard had been. This was all dirt. And the idea was the demolition of two completely uh, non-historic kitchen wings and then the entire excavation of the backyard. Here, Polshik created a warm space, a public room for lectures and panels featuring images of the Roosevelts on the main wall. And words from FDR's famous Four Freedom speech etched in back. The Roosevelt House Public Policy Center at Hunter College officially opened in 2010 and has since hosted hundreds of classes, meetings, and other public events. It's my pleasure to welcome you to these historic houses of Eleanor and Franklin and Franklin's mother, Sarah. Recently, there was a two-day symposium entitled Revisiting the Great Society from FDR to LBJ to today. It drew political and academic heavy hitters such as George McGovern, Walter Mondale, and Georgia Congressman John Lewis. You know, if, if it was not for the Voting Rights Act today, there would be no Barack Obama as President of the United States of America. It's another way of keeping the uh, Roosevelt memory alive. I mean, what's government for? What is the role of government in society? What do our values really mean in a changing world? These questions are once again on the table in our politics, and these are all very relevant to the Roosevelts. So when the Roosevelts moved to the White House, they asked that they For Jennifer Rabb, the house is about the students of Hunter College, the next generation of leaders. Franklin Roosevelt recovered from polio here. He was elected president while he was here, delivered his first address as president-elect. Do students now get that? Why are the Roosevelts important? 
Why are we having some of the same conversations today that we had in the 1930s about economic recovery? We're actually really bringing the whole history of the Roosevelt's alive. Just hearing you talking about the things that happened in this room just gives me, like, you know, goosebumps. It's so amazing. So. It's very special in a public college setting for the students to feel that their college really owns a piece of the history of these extraordinary American leaders. Roosevelt House became a New York City landmark in 1973 and was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1980. Today, it's a living monument to the Roosevelt's faith in the future. Franklin and Eleanor shaped the way we live now. And at this house, on this New York street, we can be in this remarkable couple's company once more, even if only briefly, in a place where past and future meet. This program is made possible by the generous support of Corinne Barsky, Michael and Mary Gellert, Rosalind P. Walter,